Towards the end of summer, back in 2004, an extraordinary event unfolded in an otherwise quiet and unassuming Massachusetts pond, capturing the attention of both locals and marine enthusiasts alike. What began as a typical day in this picturesque setting quickly transformed into a scene straight out of Spielberg's 1975 classic, Jaws. A great white shark, one of the ocean's most formidable predators, found itself in an unexpected predicament. It had somehow managed to trap itself inside a relatively small saltwater pond. As the community rallied to understand how a shark could end up in a situation like this, experts theorized about the circumstances that led to this bizarre event. Was it a case of mistaken navigation? Did it follow its food a bit too close to the shore? Or was it an unusual tidal surge? The incident ended up sparking a frenzy of media attention, drawing in hundreds of curious on lookers eager to catch a glimpse of the 14-foot shark. And it would mark the beginning of a complicated new relationship between Cape Cod's residents and one of the ocean's most infamous marine predators. So today we're going to have a look at the rescue efforts that ensued, the challenges faced by some of the scientists and fisheries workers. We'll figure out precisely why this shark decided to venture so close to shore, and importantly, we'll find out exactly what happened to it. This is the story of Gretel the Great White Shark, who accidentally got herself stuck in a pond. Welcome back to another Shark Bites episode, everyone. This peculiar Peculiar story literally in the last few weeks has had its 20th anniversary, so I feel like I had to do a video on it. Great white sharks are a pretty regular occurrence along the coast of Cape Cod these days, but that wasn't always the case. If we rewind all the way back to 2004, we can see that great white sharks in this part of the world were actually pretty rare. There'd been scattered reports of white sharks down the years, but these animals weren't common in the slightest. And on Wednesday the 22nd of September, that was all about to change. A rumor of a great white shark ending up in a coastal inlet the day before was spreading among locals and fishermen. Considering these sharks were just so uncommon at the time, most people treated it as just that a rumor or a story that someone had made up to fool people. Local sports fishing captain JC Burke had heard of a group of people out on a 16 foot boat in a saltwater inlet not too far from Norshan Island who were trying to fish a great white shark. He decided to call shark scientist Greg Scomal to see if he wanted to head over there and check it out for themselves. The pair were both pretty skeptical as they'd heard similar stories before that had turned out to be fake but decided to head over there the following day regardless. So they headed out of Falmouth Harbour which as a quick side note I love by the way because I live in Falmouth here in Cornwall of which the Massachusetts one was named after. Slightly off topic there. Anyway, when they arrived at the inlet, there were a few boats cruising around the inlet, as well as a number of people watching the water from a footbridge. Nothing seemed particularly out of place until a three foot dorsal fin broke the surface of the water and was heading straight towards their boat. Like a scene from Jaws, Skomal screamed that it was a white shark and both of them were stunned into silence. The shark cruised towards them and just at the last minute, its dorsal fin dipped below the surface before popping back up again on the other side of the boat. It was so close they could have touched it and that's exactly what Greg Scomal decided to do. On the off chance that this story turned out to be real, Scomal had brought with him a shark satellite tag. He'd previously tagged other sharks off the coast of Cape Cod, but never a white shark, because the only white sharks he'd come across in this region had been dead individuals who'd been entangled in fishermen's nets and accidentally caught as bycatch. And so he couldn't believe his luck when a real living white shark had basically popped up right on his doorstep. The shark was circling around their boat in the inlet, probing the edges of the pond, looking for a way out. And as it was repeatedly making the same circular motions around the pond, Skomal quickly realized that at some points during its movements, it was swimming in very shallow water. So they positioned their boat in the shallow area of the pond and waited. Sure enough, the shark circled around and came within a few feet of the boat, at which point Greg leaned over the side and popped the tag on the shark's dorsal fin. According to him, the shark didn't even flinch as he did it. In that brief moment, history was made as this pretty confused shark would become the first ever great white shark tagged in the Atlantic Ocean. Skomal wanted to get the tag on as quickly as possible because he figured that at some point sooner or later, the shark would find its way out of the inlet on its own, and this would be the perfect opportunity to get a satellite tag on it. Little did he know, the extent to which that great white shark was stuck in the pond was considerably greater than he first realized. This bizarre story of a great white shark stuck in a saltwater pond started to spread quickly. Hundreds of people began showing up in the area with boats and on foot, all desperate to get a look at the shark. And at one point, a man and two children headed into the pond in a nine foot zodiac with a tiny outboard motor. The shark ended up cruising past them, and its dorsal fin was higher out of the water than the height of the kids sitting in the boat. And it was at that point officials realized the frenzy had grown out of control. Environmental officials decided to close off the area to the public to ensure the safety of the people and the shark. Because a bunch of boats in a small pond area could just as easily injure that shark with their outboard motors as the shark could injure them. After that first manic day, the area was closed off and officials turned their attention to trying to help free the shark. They figured out that the most likely entrance route for the shark was through a shallow gap at the southern end of the pond and it had likely come in during a particular 
particularly big high tide. As to why it came so close to shore in the first place, we'll never truthfully know, but it was likely scoping out the area for seals and got caught out by the turning tide. Anyway, because it had come in on a big high tide, they thought the best way for the shark to get out would be during the next big high tide. But after a few days and several changes of the tide, the shark remained stuck, unable to find its way out the way that it had come in. Greg Scomal and John Kisholm, another shark and fishery scientist, were scratching their heads trying to figure out what to do. But this strange incident wasn't the first time a great white shark had ended up in a similar situation. 50 years before, back in 1954, a great white white shark had got itself stuck in a salt pond only two miles away from where this 2004 shark had got stuck. Perhaps some knowledge of that incident might shine a light on how to free the shark on this occasion. But after looking into the 1954 incident, any potential insights were crushed. Back then, people's perceptions of sharks weren't what they were in 2004, and the shark that had got stuck in 1954 was hooked, killed, and removed from the pond. So Scomal and his team were going to have to put their heads together and try and do something that had never been done before here. Initially, they attempted to lure the shark with food, using both a dead seal and some freshly caught tuna, two of the regular prey items for white sharks. But in this context, the shark is stressed out in an area where it absolutely does not want to be, and because of that, it's not going to be interested in feeding. And sure enough, it wasn't. Skomal and his team had also tried to use an electrical field to push the shark towards where they wanted it to go, but the shark just completely ignored it. So that wasn't going to work either. As time went on, the story of the great white shark stuck in the pond continued to grow, and after a week, it was national news. People continually attempted to gain access to the inlet to try and see the shark, which had now been affectionately named by the concerned public as Gretel the Great White Shark. Greg Scomal even started getting death threats from members of the public telling him to kill the shark. And others were even saying that if he didn't save that shark, they were going to kill him. Why are people so weird? <laughs> Anyway, after a week of trying to free the shark, Scomal and his team were running out of ideas. Dan McKiernan, a fishery scientist working on the team, decided he was going to call up a few local fishermen to see if they had any fresh ideas on how to free it. One of whom was Ernie Eldridge, who had years of experience trapping fish with weir nets using a technique learned from Native Americans. The idea was to stretch the weir nets across the inlet and block the shark from going a certain way so they could eventually push it towards the exit of the pond. And it started to work. The shark would swim towards the net, hit it, turn around, and swim the opposite way, and they realized this was the best technique they'd come up with so far. The team managed to get the shark right down towards the far southern end of the pond using the nets, but just couldn't convince it to leave through the small exit on that side. Eldridge and his team, after manually hauling all of those nets back and forth, realized there wasn't much more they could do. So they decided to leave the net as close to the outlet as they could and just wait it out, hoping the shark would eventually make its own way out. During this process, Peter Hanlon, who was working for the environmental police, had figured out another technique to move the shark around. While they were moving the nets, Hanlon, who was out on his boat, realized that he could partially direct the shark using the splash created from his boat propellers. So he decided to load up some high-powered cranberry pumps onto their boat and headed out to splash that shark with water. Firing water onto the left side of the shark made it turn right, and firing water onto the right side of the shark made it turn left. Using this technique, the team started to corral the shark towards the outlet, but at the last minute, the shark was spooked and swam quickly over an eelgrass bed between some rocks into a neighboring saltwater pond. But it was still trapped, just trapped in a much bigger pond this time. Although they realized at this point, the hose spraying strategy was the most successful one so far at moving that shark where they wanted it to go. So they loaded up with more high-powered hoses and more boats and headed out into the second inlet. But on this occasion, time was against them. The second inlet the shark had headed into, despite being larger in size, was actually shallower than the previous one. And as the tide starts to change, that inlet was going to get even shallower and the shark could easily strand itself and suffocate. So on this occasion, using two boats and two water hoses, the team set up either side of the shark and used the hoses to push it in a straight line towards the exit of the bay and out into Vineyard Sound. And it was this coordinated effort between police officers, fishermen and scientists that eventually they were able to push the shark out with the hoses to deeper water. Everyone was so excited they'd finally managed to free the shark from the saltwater pond, and Scomal and his team of scientists were even more excited that they'd just successfully tagged and released the first ever great white shark in the Atlantic. But disaster struck. 45 minutes after the shark had been released from the pond, the programming software of the tag malfunctioned and the tag popped off. It had been in shallow water for just too long, which caused the software to release it. Scomal was devastated. Having watched that tag sitting comfortably on the shark for the best part of two weeks with no issues, and then 45 minutes after releasing it, 
it popped off. The scientists working with SCOMOL had felt like they'd failed, with many of them working tirelessly day and night to free that shark, motivated by the scientific data they'd received from the tag. They didn't know when an opportunity like that would come up again, because finding a living white shark in that part of the world at that time was just so rare, let alone being able to tag it. Many of them felt like they'd missed their one and only chance to really push white shark science forwards on the east coast of America. But they were wrong this wouldn't be their one and only chance. A change in the law 30 years prior to this stranded white shark incident had already set those wheels of change in motion, and Skomal and his team just didn't realize it yet. The Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972 made it safe for seals to return to Cape Cod from Canadian waters. Although these seals didn't establish their pupping colonies until the early to mid 90s, as we moved into the new millennium, the seal populations in this part of the world began to explode, and the white sharks would eventually follow them. The trophic food web on Cape Cod was naturally re-establishing itself, showing us what it might have been like in the early 1900s, long before those populations of seals, sharks, and fish were decimated by culling and overfishing in the 50s and 60s. Cape Cod now boasts a population of over 800 white sharks, and Skomal with his team of shark scientists have identified and tagged many of them. Gretel the Great White and her story would lead to the creation of the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy, a non-profit organization dedicated to furthering scientific understanding of these animals and to educate the community about them. In the process of individually identifying all of those great white sharks, Skomal and his team at the Conservancy have never been able to re-identify identify Gretel. So after 20 years, it looks like she might now be long gone. But Gretel would also mark the beginning of a new complex relationship between sharks and humans in this part of the world. Where previously people had no concerns about shark safety, now the risk was of course greater than it was before. Since the resurgence of white sharks off the Cape, there have only been a handful of human shark incidents. The last one of which in 2018 unfortunately ended up being fatal. Locals, tourists and officials alike have all had to implement and understand shark safety protocols now. Because with a growing white shark population and a growing human population, attacks will happen. Sporadically, yes, but they will still happen. But it's thanks to conservation organizations like the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy that helps educate and implement these safety measures, ensuring the safety of both sharks and humans. All thanks to a great white shark that decided to get herself stuck in a pond. They're pretty incredible animals who always seem to be surprising us with their antics. None more so than Nicole, by the way. Have you guys heard of Nicole the Great White Shark before? Well, if you haven't, I tell you all about her in this video right here. And her story, like Gretel's, would change the course of history for great whites forever. All because she decided decided to go for a 12,000 mile swim and did it in record time. So if you wanted to learn a bit more about Nicole's story, make sure you check it out here.